The Evolution of Modesty, Part 1, Section 5, of The Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Evolution of Modesty, Part 1, Section 5. Until late in the 17th century, women in England, as well as France, suffered much in childbirth from the ignorance and superstition of incompetent midwives, owing to the prevailing conceptions of modesty, which rendered it impossible, as it is still, to some extent, in some semi-civilized lands, for male physicians to attend them. Dr. Willoughby, of Derby, tells how, in 1658, he had to creep into the chamber of a lying-in woman on his hands and knees, in order to examine her unperceived. In France, Clement was employed secretly to attend the mistresses of Louis the Fourteenth in their confinements. To the first he was conducted blindfolded, while the king was concealed among the bed-curtains, and the face of the lady was enveloped in a network of lace. Even until the Revolution, the examination of women in France, in cases of rape or attempted outrage, was left to a jury of matrons. In old English manuals of midwifery, even in the early 19th century, we still find much insistence on the demands of modesty. Thus, Dr. John Burns of Glasgow, in his Principles of Midwifery, states that some women, from motives of false delicacy, are averse from examination until the pains become severe. He adds that, it is usual for the room to be darkened, and the bed curtains drawn close, during an examination. Many old pictures show the accoucheur groping in the dark, beneath the bedclothes, to perform operations on women in childbirth. In Iceland, Winkler stated in 1861, that he sometimes slept in the same room as a whole family. It is often the custom for ten or more persons to use the same room for living in and sleeping, young and old, master and servant, male and female, and from motives of economy, all the clothes, without exception, are removed. At Cork, says Finns Morrison, in 1617, I have seen with these eyes young maidens stark naked grinding corn with certain stones to make cakes thereof. In the more remote parts of Ireland, Morrison elsewhere says, where the English laws and manners are unknown, the very chief of the Irish, men as well as women, go naked in very winter time, only having their privy parts covered with a rag of linen, and their bodies with a loose mantle. This I speak of my own experience. He goes on to tell of a Bohemian baron, just come from the north of Ireland, who told me in great earnestness that he, coming to the house of Ocane, a great lord among them, was met at the door with sixteen women, all naked, excepting their loose mantles, whereof eight or ten were very fair, and two seemed very nymphs, with which strange sight, his eyes being dazzled, they led him into the house, and then sitting down by the fire with crossed legs, like tailors, and so low as could not but offend chaste eyes, desired him to sit down with them. Soon after, O'Cain, the lord of the country, came in, all naked excepting a loose mantle and shoes, which he put off as soon as he came in, and entertaining the baron after his best manner in the Latin tongue, desired him to put off his apparel, which he thought to be a burthen to him, and to sit naked by the fire with this naked company. But the baron, for shame, durst not put off his apparel. Coriat, when traveling in Italy in the early part of the 17th century, found that in Lombardy, many of the women and children only wore smocks, or shirts, in the hot weather. At Venice and Padua, he found that wives, widows, and maids walked with naked breasts, many with backs also naked, almost to the middle. The fashion of décolleté garments, it may be remarked, only began in the 14th century, Previously, the women of Europe generally covered themselves up to the neck. In northern Italy, some years ago, a fire occurred at night in a house in which two girls were sleeping, naked, according to the custom. One threw herself out and was saved, the other returned for a garment and was burnt to death. The narrator of the incident, a man, 
expressed strong approval of the more modest girl's action. It may be added that the custom of sleeping naked is still preserved, also, according to Lippert and Strauss, in Jutland, in Iceland, in some parts of Norway, and sometimes even in Berlin. Lady Mary Wortley Montague writes in 1717 of the Turkish ladies at the baths at Sophia. The first sofas were covered with cushions and rich carpets, on which sat the ladies, and on the second their slaves behind them, but without any distinction of rank in their dress, all being in a state of nature, that is, in plain English, stark naked, without any beauty or defect concealed. Yet there was not the least wanton smile or immodest gesture among them. They walked and moved with the same majestic grace which Milton describes of our general mother. I am here convinced of the truth of a reflection I have often made, that if it was the fashion to go naked, the face would be hardly observed. At St. Petersburg, in 1774, Sir Nicholas Raxel observed, the promiscuous bathing of not less than two hundred persons, of both sexes. There are several of these public bagnios, he adds, in Petersburg, and every one pays a few kopecks for admittance. There are, indeed, separate spaces for the men and women, but they seem quite regardless of this distinction, and sit or bathe in a state of absolute nudity among each other. It is still usual for women in the country parts of Russia to bathe naked in the streams. In 1790, Wedgwood wrote to Flaxman, The nude is so general in the work of the ancients that it will be very difficult to avoid the introduction of naked figures. On the other hand, it is absolutely necessary to do so, or to keep the pieces for our own use. For none, either male or female, of the present generation, will take or apply them as furniture if the figures are naked. Mary Wollstonecraft quotes, for reprobation and not for approval, the following remarks. The lady who asked the question whether women may be instructed in the modern system of botany was accused of ridiculous prudery. Nevertheless, if she had proposed the question to me, I should certainly have answered, they cannot. She further quotes from an educational book, It would be needless to caution you against putting your hand, by chance, under your neckerchief, for a modest woman never did so. At the present time, a knowledge of the physiology of plants is not usually considered inconsistent with modesty, but a knowledge of animal physiology is still so considered by many. Dr. H. R. Hopkins of New York wrote in 1895 regarding the teaching of physiology. How can we teach growing girls the functions of the various parts of the human body and still leave them their modesty? That is the practical question that has puzzled me for years. In England, the use of drawers was almost unknown among women half a century ago and was considered immodest and unfeminine. Tilt, a distinguished gynecologist of that period, advocated such garments made of fine calico, and not to descend below the knee on hygienic grounds. Thus understood, he added, the adoption of drawers will doubtless become more general in this country, as, being worn without the knowledge of the general observer, they will be robbed of the prejudice usually attached to an appendage deemed masculine. Drawers came into general use among women during the third quarter of the 19th century. Drawers are an oriental garment and seem to have reached Europe through Venice, the great channel of communication with the East. Like many other refinements of decency and cleanliness, they are at first chiefly cultivated by prostitutes, and on that account there was a long prejudice against them. Even at the present day, it is said that in France, a young peasant girl will exclaim, if asked whether she wears drawers, I wear drawers, madame? A respectable girl? Drawers, however, quickly became acclimatized in France, and Dufour even regards them as essentially a French garment. They were introduced at the court towards the end of the 14th century, and in the 16th century were rendered almost necessary by the new fashion of Vertugale or Farthingale. In 1615, a lady's calissons are referred to as apparently an ordinary garment. It is noteworthy that in London, in the middle of the same century, young Mrs. Pepys, who was the daughter of French parents, usually wore drawers, which were seemingly of the clothes kind.
They were probably not worn by English women, and even in France, with the decay of the farthingale, they seem to have dropped out of use during the 17th century. In a technical and very complete book, Les Arts de Lingerie, published in 1771, women's drawers are not even mentioned, and Messier says that except actresses, Parisian women do not wear drawers. Even by ballet dancers and actresses on the stage, they are not invariably worn. Camargo, the famous dancer, who first shortened the skirt in dancing, early in the 18th century, always observed great decorum, never showing the leg above the knee. When appealed to as to whether she wore drawers, she replied that she could not possibly appear without such a precaution. But they were not necessarily worn by dancers, and in 1727, a young ballerina, having her skirt accidentally torn away by a piece of stage machinery, the police issued an order that in future no actress or dancer should appear on the stage without drawers. This regulation does not appear, however, to have been long strictly maintained, though Schultz refers to it as in force in 1791. Professor Irving Ross of Washington refers to New England prudishness and the colossal modesty of some New York policemen, who in certain cases want to give written rather than oral testimony. He adds, I have known this sentiment carried to such an extent in a Massachusetts small town, that a shopkeeper was obliged to drape a small but innocent statuette displayed in his window. I am told that popular feeling in South Africa would not permit the exhibition of the nude in the art collections of Cape Town, even in Italy, nude statues are disfigured by the addition of tin fig leaves, and sporadic manifestations of horror at the presence of nude statues, even when of most classic type, are liable to occur in all parts of Europe, including France and Germany. Some years ago, 1898, it was stated that the Philadelphia Ladies' Home Journal had decided to avoid, in future, all references to ladies under linen, because the treatment of this subject in print calls for minutia of detail which is extremely and pardonably offensive to refined and sensitive women. A man, married twenty years, told me that he had never seen his wife entirely nude. Such concealment of the external reproductive organs by married people appears to be common. Judging from my own inquiry, very few women care to look upon male nakedness, and many women, though not wanting an aesthetic feeling, find no beauty in man's form. Some are positively repelled by the sight of nakedness, even that of a husband or lover. On the contrary, most men delight in gazing upon the uncovered figure of women. It seems that only highly cultivated and imaginative women enjoy the spectacle of a finely shaped nude man, especially after attending art classes and drawing from the nude, as I am told by a lady artist or else the majority of women dissemble their curiosity or admiration. A woman of seventy, mother of several children, said to a young wife with whom I am acquainted, I have never seen a naked man in my life. This old lady's sister confessed that she had never looked at her own nakedness in the whole course of her life. She said that it frightened her. She was the mother of three sons. A maiden woman of the same family told her niece, that women were disgusting because they have monthly discharges. The niece suggested that women have no choice in the matter, to which the aunt replied, I know that, but it doesn't make them less disgusting. I have heard of a girl who died from hemorrhage of the womb, refusing through shame to make the ailment known to her family. The misery suffered by some women at the anticipation of a medical examination appears to be very acute. Husbands have told me of brides who sob and tremble with fright on the wedding night, the hysteria being sometimes alarming. E, aged 25, refused her husband for six weeks after marriage, exhibiting the greatest fear of his approach. Ignorance of the nature of the sexual connection is often the cause of exaggerated alarm. In Jersey, I used to hear of a bride who ran to the window and screamed murder on the wedding night. At the present day, it is not regarded as incompatible with modesty to exhibit the lower part of the thigh when in swimming costume, but it is immodest to exhibit the upper part of the thigh. In swimming competitions, a minimum of clothing must be combined with the demands of modesty. 
in england the regulations of the swimming clubs affiliated to the amateur swimming association require that the male swimmer's costume shall extend no less than eight inches from the bifurcation downward and that the female swimmer's costume shall extend to within not more than three inches from the knee a prolonged discussion we are told arose as to whether the costume should come to one two or three inches from the knee and the proposal of the youngest lady swimmer present that the costume ought to be very scanty met with little approval the modesty of women is thus seen to be greater than that of men by roughly speaking about two inches the same difference may be seen in the sleeves the male sleeve must extend for two inches the female sleeve four inches down the arm at blank bathing in the state of nature was de rigueur for the elite of the bathers while our sunday visitors from the slums frequently made a great point of wearing bathing costumes it was frequently noticed that those who were most anxious to avoid exposing their persons were distinguished by the foulness of their language my impression was that their foul-mindedness deprived them of the consciousness of safety from coarse jests if i were bathing alone among blackguards I should probably feel uncomfortable myself, if without a costume. A lady in a little city of the south of France told Paula Lombroso that young middle-class girls there were not allowed to go out except to mass, and cannot even show themselves at the window except under their mother's eye. Yet they do not think it necessary to have a cabin when sea-bathing, and even dispense with a bathing costume without consciousness of immodesty a woman mentioned to me that a man came to her and told her in confidence his distress of mind he feared he had corrupted his wife because she got into a bath in his presence with her baby and enjoyed his looking at her splashing about he was deeply distressed thinking he must have done her harm and destroyed her modesty the woman to whom this was said felt naturally indignant but also gave her the feeling as if every man may secretly despise a woman for the very things he teaches her, and only meets her confiding delight with regret or dislike. Women will occasionally be found to hide diseases and symptoms from a bashfulness and modesty so great and perverse as to be hardly credible, writes Dr. W. Wynne Westcott, an experienced coroner. I have known several cases of female deaths, reported as sudden, and of cause unknown when the medical man called in during the latter hours of life has been quite unaware that his lady patient was dying of gangrene of a strangulated femoral hernia or was bleeding to death from the bowel or from ruptured varices of the vulva the foregoing selection of facts might of course be indefinitely enlarged since i have not generally quoted from any previous collections of facts bearing on the question of modesty such collections may be found in Ploss and Max Bartwell's Das Weeb, a work that is constantly appearing in new and enlarged editions. Herbert Spencer, Descriptive Sociology, especially under such headings as clothing, moral sediments, and aesthetic products. W. G. Sumner, Folkways, Chapter 11. Managaza, Mori Deligi Uomi, Chapter 2. Westermark, Marriage, Chapter 9. Letourneau, Le Evolution de la Morale, page 126, et sequens. G. Mortimer, Chapters on Human Love, chapter 4. And in the general anthropological works of Waste Gerlin, Peskel, Ratzel, and others. End of the Evolution of Modesty, part 1, section 5. Of Modesty, Part 2, Section 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Thomas Coos. The Evolution of Modesty, Part 2, Section 1. That modesty, like all the close allied emotions, is based on fear, one of the most primitive of the emotions, seems to be fairly evident. The association of modesty and fear is even a very ancient observation, and is found in the fragments of Epicharmus while according to one of the most recent definitions modesty is the timidity of the body 
Modesty is indeed an agglomeration of fears, especially, as I hope to show, of two important and distinct fears, one of much earlier than human origin, and supplied solely by the female, the other of more distinctly human character, and of social rather than sexual origin. A child left to itself, though very bashful, is wholly devoid of modesty. Everyone is familiar with the shocking inconveniences of children in speech and act, with the charming ways in which they innocently disregard the conventions of modesty their elders thrust upon them, or, even when anxious to carry them out, wholly miss the point at issue, as when a child thinks that to put a little garment round the neck satisfies the demands of modesty. Julius Moses states that modesty in the uncovering of the sexual parts begins about the age of four, but in cases when this occurs it is difficult to exclude teaching and example. Under civilized conditions the convention of modesty long precedes its real development. Bell has found that in love affairs before the age of nine the girl is more aggressive than the boy, and that, at that age, she begins to be modest. It may fairly be said that complete development of modesty only takes place at the advent of puberty. We may admit, with Perez, one of the very few writers who touch on the evolution of this emotion, that modesty may appear at a very early age if sexual desire appears early. We should not, however, be justified in asserting that on this account modesty is a purely sexual phenomenon. The social impulses also develop about puberty, and to that coincidence the compound nature of the emotion of modesty may well be largely due. The sexual factor is, however, the simplest and most primitive element of modesty, and may therefore be mentioned first. Anyone who watches a bitch not in heat when approached by a dog with tail wagging gallantly may see the beginnings of modesty. When the dog's attentions become a little too marked, the bitch squats firmly down on the front legs and hindquarters, though when the period of oestrus comes, her modesty may be flung to the air, and she eagerly turns her hindquarters to her admirer's nose and elevates her tail in the air. Her attitude of refusal is equivalent, that is to say, to that which in the human race is typified by the classical example of womanly modesty in the Medician Venus, who withdraws the pelvis at the same time holding one hand to guard the pubes, the other to guard the breasts. The essential expression in each case is that of defense of the sexual centers against the undesired advances of the male. Strats, who criticizes the above statement, argues with photographs of nude women in illustration, that the normal type of European surprise modesty is shown by an attitude in which the arms are crossed over the breast, the most sexually attractive region, while the thighs are pressed together, one being placed before the other, the shoulder raised and the back slightly curved. Occasionally, he adds, the hands may be used to cover the face, and then the crossed arms conceal the breasts. The Medician Venus he remarks, is only a pretty woman cocketing with her body. Canova's Venus, in the pity, who has drapery in front of her, and presses her arms across her breast, being a more accurate rendering of the attitude of modesty. But Strats admits that when a surprised woman is gazed at for some time, she turns her head away, sinks or closes her eyes, and covers her pubes, or any other part she thinks is being gazed at, with one hand, while with the other she hides her breast or face. This he terms the secondary expression of modesty. Strats die Franklingdung, third edition, page 23. This is certainly true that the Medician Venus merely represents an artistic convention, a generalized tradition not founded on exact and precise observation of the gestures of modesty, and it is equally true that all the instinctive movements noted by Strats are commonly resorted to by a woman whose nakedness is surprised. But in the absence of any series of carefully recorded observations, 
one may doubt whether the distinction drawn by strats between the primary and the secondary expression of modesty can be upheld as the general rule while it is most certainly not true for every case when a young woman is surprised in a state of nakedness by a person of the opposite or even of the same sex it is her instinct to conceal the primary centers of sexual function and attractiveness in the first place the pubes in the second place the breasts the exact attitude and particular gestures of the hands in achieving the desired end vary with the individual and with the circumstances the hand may not be used at all as a veil and indeed the instinct of modesty itself may inhibit the use of the hand for the protection of modesty to turn the back towards the beholder is often the chief impulse of blushing modesty even when clothed but the application of the hand to this end is primitive and natural the lowly Fuyan woman depicted by Hyades and Deneker, who holds her hand to her pubes while being photographed, is one at this point with the Roman Venus described by Ovid, Ars Amoratoria, Book Two. Ipsa Venus pubem quotis valemnia ponit protegutur leva semi reducta manus. It may be added that young women of the lower social classes at all events in england when bathing at the seaside in complete nudity commonly grasp the sexual organs with one hand for concealment as they walk up from the sea the sexual modesty of the female animal is rooted in the sexual periodicity of the female and is an involuntary expression of the organic fact that the time for love is not now inasmuch as this fact is true of the greater part of the lives of all female animals below man the expression itself becomes so habitual that it even intrudes at those moments when it has ceased to be in place we may see this again illustrated in the bitch who when in heat herself runs after the male and again turns to flee perhaps only submitting with much persuasion to his embrace thus modesty becomes something more than a mere refusal of the male it becomes an invitation to the male and is mixed up with his ideas of what is sexually desirable in the female this would alone serve to account for the existence of modesty as a psychical secondary sexual character in this sense and in the sense only we may say with colin scott that the feeling of shame is made to be overcome and is thus correlated with its physical representative the hymen in the rupture of which as Groos remarks there is in some degree a disruption also of modesty the sexual modesty of the female is thus an inevitable by-product of the naturally aggressive attitude of the male in sexual relationships and the naturally defensive attitude of the female this again being founded on the fact that while in man and the species allied to him the sexual function in the female is periodic and during most of life a function to be guarded from the opposite sex in the male it rarely or never needs to be so guarded both male and female however need to guard themselves during the exercise of their sexual activities from jealous rivals as well as from enemies who might take advantage of their position to attack them it is highly probable that this is one important sexual factor in the constitution of modesty and shuns publicity in the exercise of sexual functions northcote has especially emphasized this element in modesty as originating in the fear of rivals that from this seeking after secrecy from motives of fear should arise an instinctive feeling that the sexual act must always be hidden is a natural enough sequence and since it is not a long step between thinking of an act as needing concealment and thinking of it as wrong it is easily conceivable that sexual intercourse comes to be regarded as a stolen and therefore in some degree a sinful pleasure animals in a state of nature almost appear to seek seclusion for sexual intercourse although this instinct is lost under domestication even the lowest savages also if uncorrupted by civilized influences seek the solitude of the forest or the protection of their huts for the same purpose the rare cases in which coitus is public 
seem usually to involve a ceremonial or social observance rather than mere personal gratification. At Loango, for instance, it would be highly improper to have intercourse in an exposed spot. It must only be performed inside the hut, with closed doors at night, when no one is present. It is on the sexual factor of modesty, existing in a well-marked form even among animals, that coquetry is founded. I am glad to find myself, on this point, in agreement with Professor Groos, who, in his elaborate study of the play instinct, has reached the same conclusion. So far from being the mere heartless play by which a woman shows her power over a man, Groos points out that coquetry possesses high biological and psychological significance, being rooted in the antagonism between the sexual instinct and inborn modesty. He refers to the roe who runs away from the stag, but in a circle. Gruse, Die Spiel der Menschen, 1899, page 339. Also, the same author's Die Spiel der Thier, page 288, at sequence. Another example of coquetry is furnished by the female kingfisher, Alcido Espida which will spend all the morning in teasing and flying away from the male, but is careful constantly to look back, and never to let him out of her sight. Many examples are given by Buschner in Leib and Leibesleben in Der Terwelt, Robert Mueller, Sexual Biologie, page 302 emphasizes the importance of coquetry as a lure to the male. It is quite true, a lady writes, to me in a private letter, that coquetry is a poor thing, and that every milkmaid can assume it, but a woman uses it principally in self-defense, while she is finding out what the man himself is like. This is in accordance with the remark of Marrow, that modesty enables a woman to put lovers to the test in order to select him who is best able to serve the natural ends of love. It is doubtless the necessity for this probationary period as a test of masculine qualities, which usually leads a woman to repel instinctively a too hasty and impatient suitor, for, as Arthur MacDonald remarks, it seems to be instinctive in young women to reject the impetuous lover without the least consideration of his character, ability, and fitness. This essential element in courtship, this fundamental attitude of pursuer and pursued, is clearly to be seen even in animals and savages. It is equally pronounced in most civilized men and women, manifesting itself in crude and subtle ways alike. Shakespeare's Angelo, whose virtue had always resisted the temptations of vice, discovered at last that modesty may more betray our sense than woman's lightness. What, asked the wise Montaigne, is the object of that virginal shame, that sedate coldness, that severe countenance, that pretense of not knowing things which they understand better than we who teach them, except to increase in us the desire to conquer and curb, to trample under our appetite, all that ceremony and those obstacles. For there is not only matter for pleasure, but for pride also in ruffling and debauching that soft sweetness and infantine modesty. The masculine attitude in the face of feminine coyness may easily pass into a kind of sadism, but is nevertheless in its origin an innocent and instinctive impulse. Restif de la Bretonne, describing his own shame and timidity as a pretty boy whom the girls would run after and kiss, adds, It is surprising that, at the same time, I would imagine the pleasure I should have in embracing a girl who resisted, in inspiring her with timidity, in making her flee, and in pursuing her. That was a part which I burned to play. It is the instinct of the sophisticated and the unsophisticated alike. The Arabs have developed an erotic ideal of sensuality, but they emphasize the importance of feminine modesty, and declare that the best woman is she who sees not men, and whom they see not. This deep-rooted modesty of women towards men in courtship is intimately interwoven with the marriage customs and magic rites of even the most primitive peoples and has survived in many civilized practices today. A prostitute may be able to simulate the modesty she may often be far from feeling, and the immense erotic advantage of the innocent over the vicious woman lies largely in the fact that in her the exquisite reactions of modesty are fresh and vigorous.
I cannot imagine anything that is more sexually exciting, remarks Hans Menjago, than to observe a person of the opposite sex, who, by some external or internal force, is compelled to fight against her physical modesty. The more modest she is, the more sexually exciting is the person she presents. It is notable that even in abnormal, as well as in normal, erotic passion, the desire is for innocent and not for vicious women, and in association with this, the desired favor to be keenly relished must often be gained by sudden surprise and not by mutual agreement. A foot fetishist writes to me, it is the stolen glimpse of a pretty foot or ankle which produces the greatest effect on me. A urolognik symbolist was chiefly excited by the act of urination when he caught a young woman unawares in the act a fetishist admirer of the states only desired to see this region in innocent girls not in prostitutes the exhibitionist almost invariably only exposes himself to apparently respectable girls a russian correspondent who feels this charm of women in a particularly strong degree is inclined to think that there is an element of perversity in it in the erotic action of the idea of feminine enjoyment, he writes, I think there are traces of a certain perversity. In fact, owing to the impressions of early youth, woman, even if we feel contempt for her in theory, is placed above us on a certain pedestal as an almost sacred being, and the more so because mysterious. Now, sensuality and sexual desire are considered as rather vulgar, and a little dirty, even ridiculous and degrading, not to say bestial. The woman who enjoys it is, therefore, rather like a profaned altar, or at least like a divinity who has descended on to the earth. To give enjoyment to a woman is therefore like perpetrating a sacrilege, or at least like taking a liberty with a god. The feelings bequeathed to us by a long social civilization maintain themselves in spite of our rational and deliberate opinions reason tells us that there is nothing evil in sexual enjoyment rather in man or woman but an unconscious feeling directs our emotions and this feeling having a germ that was placed in modern men by christianity and perhaps by still older religions says that women ought to be an absolutely pure being with ethereal sensations and that in her sexual enjoyment is out of place improper scandalous to arouse sexual emotions in a woman if not to profane a sacred host is at all events the staining of an immaculate peplos if not sacrilege it is at least irreverence or impertinence for all men the chaster a woman is the more agreeable it is to bring her to the orgasm that is felt as a triumph of the body over the soul of sin over virtue of earth over heaven there is something diabolic in such pleasure, especially when it is felt by a man intoxicated with love and full of religious respect for the virgin of his election. This feeling is, from a rational point of view, absurd and in its tendencies immoral, but it is delicious in its sacredly voluptuous subtlety. Defloration thus has its powerful fascination in the respect consciously or unconsciously felt for woman's chastity. In marriage, the feeling is yet more complicated. In deflowering his bride, the Christian, that is, any man brought up in a Christian civilization, has the feeling of committing a sort of sin, for the flesh is for him always connected with sin, which by a special privilege has for him become legitimate. He has received a special permit to corrupt innocence. Hence the peculiar prestige for civilized Christians of the wedding night sung by Shelley in ecstatic verses. O oh joy, O oh fear, what will be done in the absence of the sun? This feeling has, however, its normal range, and is not, per se, a perversity, though it may doubtless become so when unduly heightened by Christian sentiment, and especially if it leads, as to some extent, it has led, in my Russian correspondent, to an abnormal feeling of sexual attraction of girls who have only or scarcely reached the age of puberty. The sexual charm of this period of girlhood is well illustrated in many of the poems of Thomas Ashe, and is worthy of note as perhaps supporting the contention that this attraction is based on Christian feeling, that Ashe has been a clergyman. 
an attentiveness to the woman's pleasure remains in itself very far from a perversion but increases as colin scott has pointed out with civilization while its absence the indifference to the partner's pleasure is a perversion of the most degraded kind there is no such instinctive demand on the woman's part for innocence in the man in the nature of things that could not be such emotion is required for properly playing the part of the pursued it is by no means an added attraction on the part of the pursuer there is however an allied and corresponding desire which is very often clearly or latently present in the woman a longing for pleasure that is stolen or forbidden it is a mistake to suppose that this is an indication of viciousness or perversity it appears to be an impulse that occurs quite naturally in altogether innocent women the exciting charm of the risky and dangerous naturally arises on a background of feminine shyness and timidity we may trace its recognition at a very early stage of history in the story of eve and the forbidden fruit that has so often been the symbol of the masculine organs of sex it is on this ground that many have argued the folly of laying external restrictions on women in matters of love thus in quoting the great italian writer who afterwards became pope pius the second robert burton remarked i am of aeneas silvius's mind those jealous italians do very ill to lock up their wives for women are of such a disposition they will mostly covet that which is denied most and offend least when they have free liberty to trespass it is the spontaneous and natural instinct of the lover to desire modesty in his mistress and by no means any calculated opinion on his part that modesty is the sign of sexual emotion it remains true however that modesty is an expression of feminine erotic impulse we have here one of the instances of which there are so many of that curious and instinctive harmony by which nature has sought the more effectively to bring about the ends of courtship as to the fact itself there can be little doubt it constantly forces itself on the notice of careful observers and has long been decided in the affirmative by those who have discussed the matter Vinette, one of the earliest writers on the psychology of sex, after discussing the question at length, decided that the timid woman is a more ardent lover than the bold woman. It is the most prudent girl, remarked Restif de la Breton, whose experience of women was so extensive. The girl who blushes most, who is most disposed to the pleasures of love, he adds that in girls and boys alike shyness is a premature consciousness of sex this observation has even become embodied in popular proverbs do as the lasses do say no but take it is a scotch saying to which corresponds the welsh saying the more prudish the more unchaste it is not at first quite clear why an excessively shy and modest woman should be the most apt for intimate relationships with a man and in such a case the woman is often charged with hypocrisy there is however no hypocrisy in the matter the shy and reserved woman holds herself aloof from intimacy in ordinary friendship because she is acutely sensitive to the judgments of others and fears that any seemingly immodest action may make an unfavorable opinion with a lover however in whose eyes she feels assured that her actions cannot be viewed unfavorably these barriers of modesty fall down and the resulting intimacy becomes all the more fascinating to the woman because of its contrast with the extreme reserve she is impelled to maintain in other relationships it thus happens that many modest women who in non-sexual relationships with their own sex are not able to act with the physical unreserve not uncommon with women among themselves yet feel no such reserve with a man when they are once confident of his good opinion 
Much the same is true of modest and sensitive men in their relations with women. This fundamental animal factor of modesty, rooted in the natural facts of the sexual life of the higher mammals, and especially man, obviously will not explain all the phenomena of modesty. We must turn to the other great primary element of modesty, the social factor. We cannot doubt that one of the most primitive and universal of the social characteristics of man is an aptitude for disgust, founded as it is, on a yet more primitive and animal aptitude for disgust, which has little or no social significance. In nearly all races, even the most savage, we seem to find distinct traces of this aptitude for disgust in the presence of certain actions of others, an emotion naturally reflected in the individual's own actions, and hence a guide to conduct. Notwithstanding our gastric community of disgust, with lower animals, it is only in man that this disgust seems to become transformed and developed, to possess a distinctly social character, and to serve as a guide to social conduct. The objects of disgust vary infinitely according to the circumstances and habits of particular races, but the reaction of disgust is fundamental throughout. The best study of the phenomena of disgust, known to me, is, without doubt, Professor Richette's. Richette concludes that it is the dangerous and the useless which evoke disgust. The digestive and sexual excretions and secretions, being either useless or, in accordance with widespread primitive ideas, highly dangerous, the genitoanal region became a concentrated focus of disgust. It is largely for this reason, no doubt, that savage men exhibit modesty not only toward women, but toward their own sex, and that so many of the lowest savages take great precautions in obtaining seclusion for the fulfillment of natural functions. The statement, now so often made, that the primary object of clothes is to accentuate rather than to conceal, has in it as I shall point out later, a large element of truth, but it is by no means a complete account of the matter. It seems difficult not to admit that, alongside the impulse to accentuate sexual differences, there is also in both men and women a genuine impulse to concealment among the most primitive peoples, and the invincible repugnance often felt by savages to remove the girdle or apron is scarcely accounted for by the theory that it is solely a sexual lure. In this connection, it seems to me instructive to consider a special form of modesty very strongly marked among savages in some parts of the world. I refer to the feeling of immodesty in eating. Where this feeling exists, modesty is offended when one eats in public. The modest man retires to eat. Indecency, said Cook, was utterly unknown among the Tahitians. But they would not eat together. Even brothers and sisters had their separate baskets of provisions, and generally sat some yards apart, with their backs to each other when they ate. The Warua of Central Africa, Cameron found, when offered a drink, put up a cloth before their faces while they swallowed it, and would not allow anyone to see them eat or drink, so that every man or woman must have his own fire and cook for himself. Carl von den Steinen remarks in his interesting book on Brazil that though the Bacairi of central Brazil have no feeling of shame about nakedness, they are ashamed to eat in public. They retire to eat and hung their heads in shame-faced confusion when they saw him innocently eat in public. Rolf von Stevens found that when he gave an orang lot malay woman anything to eat she not only would not eat it if her husband were present but if any man were present she would go outside before eating or giving her children to eat 
thus among these people the act of eating in public produces the same feelings as among ourselves the indecent exposure of the body in public it is quite easy to understand how this arises whenever there is any pressure on the means of substance as among savages at some time or another there nearly always is it must necessarily arouse a profound and mixed emotion of desire and disgust to see another person putting into his stomach what might just as well have put into one's own the special secrecy sometimes observed by women is probably due to the fact that women would be less able to resist the emotions that the act of eating would arouse in onlookers as social feeling develops a man desires not only to eat in safety but also to avoid being an object of disgust and to spare his friends all unpleasant emotions hence it becomes a requirement of ordinary decency to eat in private a man who eats in public becomes like the man who in our cities exposes his person in public an object of disgust and contempt end of the evolution of modesty part two section one recording by john thomas coos kuzmarski john thomas coos www.validateyourlife.com of modesty part two section two of studies in the psychology of sex volume one by havelock ellis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by john thomas coos the evolution of modesty part two section two long ago when a hospital student on midwifery duty in london slums i had occasion to observe that among the women of the poor and more especially in those who had lost the first bloom of youth modesty consisted chiefly in the fear of being disgusting there was an almost pathetic anxiety in the face of pain and discomfort not to be disgusting in the doctor's eyes this anxiety expressed itself in the ordinary symptoms of modesty but as soon as the woman realized that i found nothing disgusting in whatever was proper and necessary to be done under the circumstances it almost invariably happened that every sign of modesty at once disappeared in the special and elementary conditions of parturition modesty is reduced to this one fear of causing disgust so that when that is negated the emotion is non-existent and the subject becomes without effort as direct and natural as a little child a fellow student on similar duty who also discovered for himself the same character of modesty that if he was careful to guard her modesty the woman was careful also and that if he was not the woman was not remarked on it to me with sadness it seemed to him derogatory to womanhood that what he had been accustomed to consider its supreme grace should be so superficial that he could at will set limits to it i thought then as i think still that that was rather a perversion of the matter and that nothing becomes degrading because we happen to have learned something about its operations but i am more convinced than ever that the fear of causing disgust a fear quite distinct from that of losing a sexual lure or breaking a rule of social etiquette plays a very large part in the modesty of the more modest sex and in modesty generally our venuses as lucretius long since remarked and montaigne after him are careful to conceal from their lovers the vita possenia and that fantastic fate which placed so near together the supreme foci of physical attraction and physical repugnance has immensely contributed to build up all the subtlest coquetries of courtship whatever stimulates self-confidence and lulls the fear of evoking disgust whether it is the presence of a beloved person in whose good opinion complete confidence is felt or whether it is merely the grosser narcotizing influence of a slight degree of intoxication always automatically lulls the emotion of modesty 
Together with the animal factor of sexual refusal, this social fear of evoking disgust seems to me the most fundamental element in modesty. It is, of course, impossible to argue that the fact of the sacropubic region of the body being the chief focus of concealment proves the importance of this factor of modesty, but it may fairly be argued that it owes this position not merely to being the sexual center, but also as being the excretory center. Even among many lower mammals, as well as among birds and insects, there is a well-marked horror of dirt, somewhat disguised by the varying ways in which an animal may be said to define dirt. Many animals spend more time and energy in the duties of cleanliness than human beings, and they often show well-marked anxiety to remove their own excrement or to keep away from it. Thus, the element of modesty also may be said to have an animal basis. It is on this animal basis that the human and social fear of arousing disgust has developed. Its probably wide extension is indicated not only by the strong feeling attached to the constant presence of clothing on this part of the body, such as constant presence being quite uncalled for if the garment or ornament is merely a sort of sexual war paint, but by the repugnance felt by many savages, very low down in the scale to the public satisfaction of natural needs and to their more than civilized cleanliness in this connection. It is further of interest to note that in some parts of the world the covering is not in front but behind, though of this fact there are probably other explanations. Among civilized people also, it may be added, the final and invincible seat of modesty is sometimes not around the pubes but the anus. That is to say that in such cases the fear of arousing disgust is the ultimate and most fundamental element of modesty. The concentration of modesty around the anus is sometimes very marked. Many women feel so high a degree of shame and reserve with regard to this region that they are comparatively indifferent to an anterior examination of the sexual organs. A similar feeling is not seldom found in men. I would permit of an examination of my genitals by a medical man without any feeling of discomfort. A correspondent writes, but I think I would rather die than submit to any rectal examination. Even physicians have been known to endure painful rectal disorders for years rather than undergo examination. Among ordinary English girls, a medical correspondent writes, I have often noticed that the dislike and shame of allowing a man to have sexual intercourse with them when newly married is simply due to the fact that the sexual aperture is so closely opposed to the anus and bladder. If the vulva and vagina were situated between a woman's shoulder blades and a man had a separate instrument for coitus, not used for any excretory purpose, I do not think women would feel about intercourse as they sometimes do. Again, in their ignorance of anatomy, women often look upon the vagina and womb as part of the bowel and its exit of discharge and sometimes say, for instance, inflammation of the bowel when they mean womb. Again, many, perhaps most, women believe that they pass water through the vagina and are ignorant of the existence of the separate urethral orifice. Again, women associate the vulva with the anus and so feel ashamed of it, even when speaking to their husbands or to a doctor or among themselves, they have absolutely no name for the vulva. I mean among the upper classes and people of gentle birth, but speak of it as down below, low down, etc. Even though this feeling is largely based on wrong and ignorant ideas, it must still be recognized that it is to some extent natural and inevitable. How much is risked, exclaimed Dugas in Privacies of Love, the Results may be disillusion, disgust, the consciousness of physical imperfection, of brutality or coldness, of aesthetic in disenchantment, of a sentimental shock, seen or divined. To be without modesty, that is to say, to have no fear of the ordeals of love, one must be sure of oneself, 
of one's grace, of one's physical emotions, of one's feelings, and be sure, moreover, of the effect of all these on the nerves, the imagination, and the heart of another person. Let us suppose modesty reduced to aesthetic discomfort, to a woman's fear of displeasing, or of not seeming beautiful enough. Even thus defined, how can modesty avoid being always awake and restless? What woman could repeat, without risk, the tranquil action of ferony? And even in that action, who knows how much may not have been due to mere professional insolence? Dugas, La Pugere, Revue Philosophique, November 1903. Men and Women, Shorts points out, Alters Clayson and Manor Bund, page 41 to 51, have certainly the capacity mutually to supplement and enrich each other, but when this completion fails, or is not sought, the difference may easily become a strong antipathy, and he proceeds to develop the wide-reaching significance of this psychic fact. I have emphasized the proximity of the ectatory centers to the sexual focus in discussing this important factor of modesty, because in analyzing so complex and elusive an emotion as modesty it is desirable to keep as near as possible to the essential and fundamental facts on which it is based it is scarcely necessary to point out that in ordinary civilized society these fundamental facts are not usually present at the surface of consciousness and may even be absent altogether on the foundation of them may rise all sorts of idealized fears or delicate reserves of aesthetic refinements as the emotions of love become more complex and more subtle and the crude simplicity of the basis on which they finally rest becomes inevitably concealed Another factor of modesty, which reaches a high development in savagery, is the ritual element, especially the idea of ceremonial uncleanness, based on a dread of the supernatural influences which the sexual organs and functions are supposed to exert. It may be to some extent rooted in the elements already referred to, and it leads us into a much wider field than that of modesty, so that it is only necessary to touch slightly on it here. It has been exhaustively studied by Fraser and by Crawley. Offenses against the ritual rendered necessary by this mysterious dread, though more serious than offenses against sexual reticence or the fear of causing disgust, are so obviously allied that they all reinforce one another and cannot easily be disentangled. Nearly everywhere, all over the world, at a primitive stage of thought, and even to some extent in the highest civilization, the sight of the sexual organs, or of the sexual act, the image, or even the names of the sexual parts of either man or woman, are believed to have a curiously potent influence, sometimes beneficent, but quite as often maleficent. The two kinds of influence may even be combined, and Rydell, quoted by Ploss and Bartels, states that the Ambon Islanders carve a schematic representation of the vulva on their fruit trees, in part to promote the productiveness of the trees, and in part to scare any unauthorized person who might be tempted to steal the fruit. The precautions prescribed as regards coitus at Loango are evidently associated with religious fears. In Ceylon, again, as a medical correspondent there informs me, where the penis is worshipped and held sacred, a native never allows it to be seen, except under compulsion by a doctor, and even a wife must neither see it, nor touch it, nor ask for coitus, though she must grant as much as the husband desires. All savage and barbarous peoples who have attained any high degree of ceremonialism have included the functions not only of sex, but also of excretion, more or less stringently within the bounds of that ceremonialism. It is only necessary to refer to the Jewish ritual books of the Old Testament, to Hesiod, and to the customs prevalent among Mohammedan peoples. Modesty in eating also has its roots by no means only in the fear of causing disgust, 
but very largely in this kind of ritual, and Crawley has shown how numerous and frequent among primitive peoples are the religious implications of eating and drinking. So profound is this dread of the sacred mystery of sex, and so widespread is the ritual based upon it, that some have imagined that here alone we may find the complete explanation of modesty, and Salomon Reinach declares that at the origin of the emotion of modesty lies a taboo. Durkheim, La Prohibition de l'Inceste, L'Anne Sociologique, 1898, page 50, arguing that whatever sense of repugnance women may inspire must necessarily reach the highest point around the womb, which is hence subjected to the most stringent taboo. Incidentally, suggests that here is an origin of modesty. The sexual organs must be veiled at an early period to prevent the dangerous effluvia which they give off from reaching the environment. The veil is often a method of intercepting magic action. Once constituted, the practice would be maintained and transformed. It was doubtless as a secondary and derived significance that the veil became, as Reinock, Le Voil de l'Oblation, op. site, page 299-311, to shows it was, alike among the Romans and in the Catholic Church, the sign of consecration of the gods. At an early stage of culture, again, menstruation is regarded as a process of purification, a dangerous expulsion of vitiated humors. Hence, the term catharsis applied to it by the Greeks. Hence, also, the medieval view of women, mulier speciosa templum edificatum super cloacum, said Bothius. The sacropubic region in women because it excludes the source of menstruation, thus becomes a specially heightened seat of taboo, according to the Mosaic Law, Leviticus, chapter 20, volume 18. If a man uncovered a menstruating woman, both were to be cut off. It is probable that the Mohammedan custom of veiling the face and head really has its source solely in another aspect of this ritual factor of modesty, it must be remembered that this custom is not Mohammedan in its origin, since it existed long previously among the Arabians, and is described by Tertullian. In early Arabia, very handsome men also veiled their faces in order to preserve themselves from the evil eye. And it has been conjectured with much probability that the origin of the custom of women veiling their faces may be traced to this magical religious precaution. Among the Jews of the same period, according to Buschler, the women had their heads covered and never cut their hair to appear in the streets without such covering would be like a prostitute and was adequate ground for divorce. Adulterous women were punished by uncovering their heads and cutting their hair. It is possible, though not certain, that St. Paul's obscure injunction to women to cover their heads because of the angels may really be based on the ancient reason that when uncovered they would be exposed to the wanton assaults of spirits one corinthians chapter eleven v five to six exactly as singleese women believe that they must keep the vulva covered lest demons should have intercourse with them even at the present day st paul's injunction is still observed by christendom which is, however, far from accepting, or even perhaps understanding, the folklore ground on which are based such injunctions. Crawley thus summarizes some of the evidence concerning the significance of the veil. Sexual shyness, not only in woman, but in man, is intensified at marriage, and forms a chief feature of the dangerous sexual properties mutually feared. When fully ceremonial, the idea takes on the meaning that satisfaction of these feelings will lead to their neutralization, as, in fact, it does. The bridegroom in ancient Sparta supped on the wedding night at the men's mess, and then visited his bride, leaving her before daybreak. This practice was continued, and sometimes children were born before the pair had ever 
seen each other's faces by day at weddings in the babar islands the bridegroom has to hunt for his bride in a darkened room this lasts a good while if she is shy in south africa the bridegroom may not see his bride till the whole of the marriage ceremonies have been performed in persia a husband never sees his wife till he has consummated the marriage at marriages in south arabia the bride and bridegroom have to sit immovable in the same position from noon till midnight fasting in separate rooms the bride is attended by ladies and the groom by men they may not see each other till the night of the fourth day in egypt the groom cannot see the face of his bride even by a surreptitious glance till she is in his absolute possession then comes the ceremony which he performs of uncovering her face in egypt of course this has been accentuated by the seclusion and veiling of women in morocco at the feast before the marriage the bride and groom sit together on a sort of throne all the time the poor bride's eyes are firmly closed and she sits amidst the revelry as immovable as a statue on the next day is the marriage she is conducted after dark to her future home accompanied by a crowd with lanterns and candles she is led with closed eyes along the street by two relatives each holding one of her hands the bride's head is held in its proper position by a female relative who walks behind her she wears a veil and is not allowed to open her eyes until she is set on the bridal bed with a girl friend beside her amongst the zulus the bridal party proceeds to the house of the groom having the bride hidden amongst them they stand facing the groom while the bride sings a song her companions then suddenly break away and she is discovered standing in the middle with a fringe of beads covering her face amongst the people of kumaun the husband sees his wife first after the joining of hands amongst the bedouin of northeast africa the bride is brought on the evening of the wedding day by her girl friends to the groom's house she is closely muffled up amongst the jews of jerusalem the bride at the marriage ceremony stands under the nuptial canopy her eyes being closed that she may not behold the face of her future husband before she reaches the bridal chamber in melanesia the bride is carried to her new home on someone's back wrapped in many mats with palm fans held about her face because she is supposed to be modest and shy among the damaras the groom cannot see his bride for four days after marriage when a damara woman is asked in marriage she covers her face for a time with the flap of a headdress made for this purpose at the thlinkit marriage ceremony the bride must look down and keep her head bowed all the time during the wedding day she remains hiding in a corner of the house and the groom is forbidden to enter at a yazidi marriage the bride is covered from head to foot with a thick veil and when arrived at her new home she retires behind a curtain in the corner of a darkened room where she remains for three days before her husband is permitted to see her in korea the bride has to cover her face with her long sleeves when meeting the bridegroom at the wedding the manchurian bride uncovers her face for the first time when she descends from the nuptial couch it is dangerous even to see dangerous persons sight is a method of contagion in primitive science and the idea coincides with the psychological aversion to da see dangerous things and with sexual shyness and timidity in the customs noticed we can distinguish the feeling that it is dangerous to the bride for her husband's eyes to be upon her and the feeling of bashfulness in her which induces her neither to see him nor to be seen by him these ideas explain the origin of the bridal veil and similar concealments the bridal veil is used to take a few instances in china burma korea russia bulgaria Manchuria, and persia and in all these cases it conceals the face entirely e crawley the mystic rose page three twenty eight at sequence 
Alexander Walker, writing in 1846, remarks among old-fashioned people, of whom a good example may be found in old country people of the middle class in England, it is indecent to be seen with the head unclothed. Such a woman is terrified at the chance of being seen in that condition, and if intruded on at that time, she shrieks with terror and flies to conceal herself. A. Walker Beauty, page 15. This fear of being seen with the head uncovered exists still. M. Van Gennep informs me in some regions of France, as in Britannia. So far it has only been necessary to refer incidentally to the connection of modesty with clothing. I have sought to emphasize the unquestionable but often forgotten fact that modesty is in its origin independent of clothing, that physiological modesty takes precedence of anatomical modesty, and that the primary factors of modesty were certainly developed long before the discovery of either ornament or garments. The rise of clothing probably had its first psychical basis on an emotion of modesty already compositely formed of the elements we have traced. Both the main elementary factors, it may be noted, must naturally tend to develop and unite in a more complex, though it may well be, much less intense emotion. The impulse which leads the female animal as it leads some African women, when found without their girdles, to squat firmly down on the earth, becomes a more refined and extended play of gesture and ornament and garment. A very notable advance, I may remark, is made when this primary attitude of defense against the action of the male becomes a defense against his eyes. We may thus explain the spread of modesty to various parts of the body, even when we exclude the more special influence of the evil eye. The breasts very early become a focus of modesty in women. This may be observed among many naked or nearly naked negro races. The tendency of the nates to become the chief seat of modesty in many parts of Africa may probably be, in large part, thus explained, since the full development of the gluteal regions is often the greatest attraction an African woman can possess. The same cause contributes, doubtless, to the face becoming, in some races, the center of modesty. We see the influence of this defense against strange eyes in the special precautions in gesture or clothing taken by the women in various parts of the world against the more offensive eyes of civilized Europeans. But, in thus becoming directed only against sight and not against action, the gestures of modesty are at once free to become merely those of coquetry. When there is no real danger of offensive action, there is no need for more than playful defense, and no serious anxiety should that defense be taken as a disguised invitation. Thus the road is at once fully open toward the most civilized manifestations of the comedy of courtship. End of The Evolution of Modesty, Part 2, Section 2, read by John Thomas Coos, www.validatelife.com. Part 2, Section 3, of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Newfeld. The Evolution of Modesty, Part 2, Section 3 In the same way, the social fear of arousing disgust combines easily and perfectly with any new development in the invention of ornament or clothing as sexual lures. Even among the most civilized races, it has often been noted that the fashion of feminine garments, as also sometimes the use of scents, has the double object of concealing and attracting. It is so with a little apron of a young savage belle. The heightening of the attraction is indeed a logical outcome of the fear of evoking disgust. It is possible, as some ethnographists have observed, that intercrural cords and other primitive garments have a physical ground, inasmuch as they protect the most sensitive and unprotected part of the body, 
especially in women. We may note in this connection the significant remarks of K. von den Steinen, who argues that among Brazilian tribes, the object of the Uluri, etc., is to obtain a maximum of protection for the mucous membrane with a minimum of concealment. Among the Eskimo, as Nansen noted, the corresponding intercural cord is so thin as to be often practically invisible. This may be noted, I may add, in the excellent photographs of Eskimo women given by Holm. But it is evident that in the beginning protection is to little or no extent the motive of attaching foreign substances to the body. Thus the tribes of central Australia wear no clothes, although they often suffer from the cold. But in addition to armlets, neckbands, and headbands, they have string or hair girdles, with for the women a very small apron, and for the men a pubic tassel. The latter does not conceal the organs, being no larger than a coin, and often brilliantly coated with white pipe clay, especially during the progress of corroborees, when a large number of men and women meet together. It serves the purpose of drawing attention to the organs. When Forster visited the unspoiled islanders of the Pacific early in the eighteenth century, he tells us that though they wore no clothes, they found it necessary to cover themselves with various ornaments, especially on the sexual parts. But though their males, he remarks, were to all appearances equally anxious in this respect with their females, this part of their dress served only to make that part more conspicuous which it intended to hide. He adds the significant remark that, quote, these ideas of decency and modesty are only observed at the age of sexual maturity, unquote. Just as in Central Australia, women may only wear aprons after the initiation of puberty. There are certain things, said Montaigne, which are hidden in order to be shown. And there can be no doubt that the contention of Westermark and others, that ornament and clothing were in the first place intended not to conceal or even to protect the body, but in large part to render it sexually attractive, is fully proved. We cannot, in the light of all that has gone before, regard ornaments and clothing as the sole cause of modesty, but the feelings that are thus gathered around the garment constitute a highly important factor of modesty. Among some Australian tribes it is said that the sexual organs are only covered during their erotic dances, and it is further said that in some parts of the world only prostitutes are clothed. The scanty covering, as Westermark observes, was found to act as the most powerful obtainable sexual stimulus. It is undoubtedly true that this statement may be made not merely of the savage, but of the most civilized world. All observers agree that the complete nudity of savages, unlike the civilized décolleté or détrousse, has no suggestion of sexual allurement. Dr. R. W. Falcon remarks, concerning Central Africa, that he has never met more indecency than in Uganda, where the penalty of death is inflicted on an adult found naked in the street. A study of pictures or statuary will alone serve to demonstrate that nakedness is always chaster in its effects than partial clothing. As a well-known artist, Du Maurier, has remarked, in Trilby, it is, quote, a fact well known to all painters and sculptors who have used the nude model except a few shady pretenders, whose purity, not being of the right sort, has gone rank from too much watching, that nothing is so chaste as nudity. Venus herself, as she drops her garments and steps on to the model throne, leaves behind her on the floor every weapon in her armory by which she can pierce to the grosser passions of men." Burton, in The Anatomy of Melancholy, deals at length with the allurements of love, and concludes that, quote, the greatest provocations of lust are from our apparel. End quote. The artist's model, as one informs me, is much less exposed to liberties from men when nude than when she is partially clothed. And it may be noted that in Paris studios, the model who poses naked undresses behind a screen. An admirable poetic rendering of this element in the philosophy of clothing has been given by Herrick, that master of erotic psychology, in A Lily in Crystal, where he argues that a lily in crystal, and amber in a stream, and strawberries in cream, 
gain an added delight from semi-concealment and so he concludes we obtain a rule how far to teach your nakedness must reach in this connection also it is worth noting that stanley hall in a report based on returns from nearly a thousand persons mostly teachers finds that of the three functions of clothes protection ornament and lutzian self-feeling the second is by far the most conspicuous in childhood the attitude of children is testimony to the primitive attitude toward clothing it cannot however be said that the use of clothing for the sake of showing the natural forms of the body has everywhere been developed in japan where nakedness is accepted without shame clothes are worn to cover and conceal not to reveal the body it is so also in china a distinguished chinese gentleman who had long resided in europe once told bales that he had gradually learnt to grasp the european point of view but that it would be impossible to persuade his fellow countrymen that a woman who used her clothes to show off her figure could possibly possess the least trace of modesty the great artistic elaboration often displayed by articles of ornament or clothing even when very small and the fact as shown by karl von den steinen regarding brazilian uluri that they may serve as common motives in general decoration sufficiently prove that such objects attract rather than avoid attention and while there is invincible repugnance among some people to remove these articles such repugnance often being strongest when the adornment is most minute others have no such repugnance or are quite indifferent whether or not their aprons are accurately adjusted the mere presence or possession of the article gives the required sense of self-respect of human dignity of sexual desirability thus it is that to unclothe a person is to humiliate him this was so even in homeric times for we may recall the threat of ulysses to strip thyestes when clothing is once established another element this time a socio-economic element often comes in to emphasize its importance and increase the anatomical modesty of women i mean the growth of that conception of women as property weitz followed by schurz and le tourneau has insisted that the jealousy of husbands is the primary origin of clothing and indirectly of modesty diderot in the eighteenth century had already given clear expression to the same view it is undoubtedly true that only married women are among some peoples clothed the unmarried women though full-grown remain naked in many parts of the world also as montegazza and others have shown where the men are naked and the women covered clothing is regarded as a sort of disgrace and men can only with difficulty be persuaded to adopt it before marriage a woman was often free and not bound to chastity and at the same time was often naked after marriage she was clothed and no longer free to the husband's mind the garment appears illogically though naturally a moral and physical protection against any attack on his property thus a new motive was furnished this time somewhat artificially for making nakedness in women at all events disgraceful as the conception of property also extended to the father's right over his daughters and the appreciation of male chastity developed this motive spread to unmarried as well as married women a woman on the west coast of africa must always be chaste because she is first the property of her parents and afterwards of her husband and even in the seventeenth century of christendom so able a thinker as bishop bournet furnished precisely the same reason for feminine chastity this conception probably constituted the chief and most persistent element furnished to the complex emotion of modesty by the barbarous stages of human civilization this economic factor necessarily involved the introduction of a new moral element into modesty if a woman's chastity is the property of another person it is essential that she shall be modest in order that men may not be tempted to incur the penalties involved by the infringement of property rights thus modesty is strictly inculcated on women in order that men may be safeguarded from temptation the fact was overlooked that modesty is itself a temptation immodesty being on this ground disapproved by men a new motive for modesty is furnished to women 
In the book which the Knight of the Tower, Landry, wrote in the fourteenth century for the instruction of his daughters, this factor of modesty is naively revealed. He tells his daughters of the trouble that David got into through the thoughtlessness of Bathsheba, and warns them that, quote, Every woman ought religiously to conceal herself when dressing and washing, and neither out of vanity nor yet to attract attention show either her hair or her neck or her breast, or any part which ought to be covered. End quote. Hinton went so far as to regard what he termed body modesty as entirely a custom imposed upon women by men with the object of preserving their own virtue. While this motive is far from being the sole source of modesty, it must certainly be borne in mind as an inevitable outcome of the economic factor of modesty. In Europe, it seems probable that the generally accepted conceptions of medieval chivalry were not without influence in constituting the forms in which modesty shows itself among us. In the early Middle Ages, there seems to have been a much greater degree of physical familiarity between the sexes than is commonly found among barbarians elsewhere. There was certainly considerable promiscuity in bathing, and indifference to nakedness. It seems probable, as Durkheim points out, that this state of things was modified in part by the growing force of the dictates of Christian morality, which regarded all intimate approaches between the sexes as sinful, and in part by the influences of chivalry, with its aesthetic and moral ideas of women, as the representative of all the delicacies and elegancies of civilization. This ideal was regarded as incompatible with the familiarities of the existing social relationships between the sexes, and thus a separation, which at first existed only in art and literature, began by a curious reaction to exert an influence on real life. The chief new feature, it is scarcely a new element, added to modesty when an advanced civilization slowly emerges from barbarism, is the elaboration of its social ritual. Civilization expands the range of modesty, and renders it at the same time more changeable. The French seventeenth century and the English eighteenth represent early stages of modern European civilization, and they both devoted special attention to the elaboration of the minute details of modesty. The frequenters of the Hotel Rambouillet, the Précieuse, satirized by Molière, were not only engaged in refining the language, they were refining feelings and ideas, and enlarging the boundaries of modesty. In England, such famous and popular authors as Swift and Stern bear witness to a new ardor of modesty in the sudden reticences, the dashes, and the asterisks which are found throughout their works, the altogether new quality of literary prurience, of which Stern is still the classical example, could only have arisen on the basis of the new modesty which was then overspreading society and literature. Idle people, mostly, no doubt, the women in salons and drawing-rooms, people more familiar with books than with the realities of life, now laid down the rules of modesty, and were ever enlarging it, ever inventing new subtleties of gesture and speech, which it would be immodest to neglect, and which are ever being rendered vulgar by use, and ever changing. It was at this time, probably, that the custom of inventing an arbitrary private vocabulary of words and phrases for the purpose of disguising references to functions and parts of the body, regarded as immodest and indecent, first began to become common. Such private slang, growing up independently in families, and especially among women, as well as between lovers, is now almost universal. It is not confined to any European country, and has been studied in Italy by Nietzsche Foro, who regards it as a weapon of social defense against an inquisitive and hostile environment, since it enables things to be said with a meaning which is unintelligible to all but the initiated person. While it is quite true that the custom is supported by the consciousness of its practical advantages, it has another source in a desire to avoid what is felt to be the vulgar immodesty of direct speech. This is sufficiently shown by the fact that such slang is mostly concerned with the sacro-pubic sphere. It is one of the chief contributions to the phenomena of modesty furnished by civilization. The claims of modesty having affected the clothing of the body, the impulse of modesty finds a further sphere of activity, half playful yet wholly imperative, in the clothing of language. 
modesty of speech has however a deep and primitive basis although in modern europe it only became conspicuous at the beginning of the eighteenth century all over the world as dufour put it to do is good to say is bad reticences of speech are not adequately accounted for by the statement that modesty tends to irradiate from the action to the words describing the action for there is a tendency for modesty to be more deeply rooted in the words than in the actions modest women as klein paul truly remarks have a much greater horror of saying immodest things than of doing them they believe that fig leaves were especially made for the mouth it is a tendency which is linked on to the religious and ritual feeling which we have already found to be a factor of modesty and which even when applied to language appears to have an almost or quite instinctive basis for it is found among the most primitive savages who very frequently regard a name as too sacred or dangerous to utter among the tribes of central australia in addition to his ordinary name each individual has his sacred or secret name only known to the older and fully initiated members of his own totemic group among the waramunga it is not permitted to women to utter even a man's ordinary name though she knows it in the mysterious region of sex this feeling easily takes root in many parts of the world men use among themselves and women use among themselves words and even languages which they may not use without impropriety in speaking to persons of the opposite sex and it has been shown that exogamy or the fact that the wife belongs to a different tribe will not always account for this phenomenon a special vocabulary for the generative organs and functions is very widespread thus in northwest central queensland there is both a decent and an involuntary vocabulary for the sexual parts in mitakudi language for instance mene may be used for the vulva in the best aboriginal society but kunja and pukil which are names for the same parts are the most blackguardly words known to the native among the malays puki is also a name for the vulva which it is very indecent to utter and it is only used in public by people under the influence of an obsessive nervous disorder the swahili women of africa have a private metaphorical language of their own referring to sexual matters and in Samoa, again, young girls have a euphemistic name for the penis, Auwaluma, which is not in common use. Exactly the same thing is found in Europe today, and is sometimes more marked among young peasant women than among those of better social class, who often avoid, under all circumstances, the necessity for using any definite name. Singular as it may seem, the Romans who in their literature impress us by their vigorous and naked grip of the most private facts of life, showed in familiar intercourse a dread of obscene language, a dread ultimately founded, it is evident, on religious grounds, far exceeding that which prevails among ourselves today in civilization. It is remarkable, Dufour observes, that the prostitutes of ancient Rome would have blushed to say an indecent word in public, the little tender words used between lovers and their mistresses were not less correct and innocent when the mistress was a courtesan and the lover of an erotic poet he called her his rose his queen his goddess his dove his light his star and she replied by calling him her jewel her honey her bird her ambrosia the apple of her eye and never with any licentious interjection but only i will love amabo a frequent exclamation summing up a whole life and vocation when intimate relations began they treated each other as brother and sister these appellations were common among the humblest and the proudest courtesans alike so excessive was the roman horror of obscenity that even physicians were compelled to use a euphemism for urina and though the urinal or vas urinarium was openly used at the dining-table following a custom introduced by the sybarites according to athenius the decorous guest could not ask for it by name but only by a snap of the fingers in modern europe as seems fairly evident from the early realistic dramatic literature of various countries no special horror of speaking plainly regarding the sacro-pubic regions and their functions existed among the general population until the seventeenth century there is however one marked exception 
such a feeling clearly existed as regards menstruation. It is not difficult to see why it should have begun at this function. We have here not only a function confirmed to one sex, and therefore easily lending itself to a vocabulary confined to one sex, but what is even of more importance, the belief which existed among the Romans, as elsewhere throughout the world, concerning the specially dangerous and mysterious properties of menstruation, survived throughout the Middle Ages. The very name, menses, monthlies, is a euphemism, and most of the old scientific names for this function are similarly vague. As regards popular feminine terminology previous to the eighteenth century, Schurich gives us fairly ample information. He remarks that both in Latin and Germanic countries, menstruation was commonly designated by some term equivalent to flowers because, he says, it is a blossoming that indicates the possibility of fruit. German peasant women, he tells us, called it the rose-wreath, Rosenkranz. Among the other current feminine names for menstruation which he gives us, some are purely fanciful. Thus the Italian women dignified the function with the title of Marchese Magnifico. German ladies, again, would use the locution, I have had a letter or would say that their cousin or aunt had arrived. These are closely similar to the euphemisms still used by women. It should be added that euphemisms for menstruation are not confined to Europe, and are found among savages. According to Hiltut, one of these euphemisms was putting on the moccasin, and in another branch of the same people, putting the knees together, going outside, an allusion to the customary seclusion at this period in a solitary hut, and so on. It would, however, be a mistake to suppose that this process is an intensification of modesty. It is, on the contrary, an attenuation of it. The observances of modesty become merely a part of a vast body of rules of social etiquette, though a somewhat stringent part, on account of the vague sense still persisting of a deep-lying natural basis. It is a significant coincidence that the eighteenth century, which was marked by this new extension of the social ritual of modesty, also saw the first appearance of a new philosophic impulse not merely to analyze, but to dissolve the conception of modesty. This took place more especially in France. The swift rise to supremacy, during the seventeenth century, of logical and rational methods of thinking, in conjunction with the new development of geometrical and mathematical science, led in the eighteenth century to a widespread belief in France that human customs and human society ought to be founded on a strictly logical and rational basis. It was a belief which ignored those legitimate claims of the emotional nature which the nineteenth century afterwards investigated and developed but it was of immense service to mankind in clearing away useless prejudices and superstitions, and it culminated in the reforms of the great revolution which most other nations have been since painfully struggling to attain. Modesty offered a tempting field for the eighteenth-century philosophic spirit to explore. The manner in which the most distinguished and adventurous minds of the century approached it can scarcely be better illustrated than by a conversation reported by Madame Le Panet, which took place in 1750 at the table of Mademoiselle Quinault, the eminent actress. A fine virtue, Duclos remarked, which one fastens on in the morning with pins. He proceeded to argue that a moral law must hold good always and everywhere, which modesty does not. Saint Lambert, the poet, observed that it must be acknowledged that one can say nothing good about innocence without being a little corrupted, and Duclos added, or of modesty without being impudent. Saint Lambert finally held forth with much poetic enthusiasm concerning the desirability of consummating marriages in public. This view of modesty, combined with the introduction of Greek fashions, gained ground to such an extent that towards the end of the century, women, to the detriment of their health, were sometimes content to dress in transparent gauze, and even to walk abroad in the Champs-Élysées without any clothing. That, however, was too much for the public. The final outcome of the eighteenth-century spirit in this direction was, as we know, by no means the dissolution of modesty, but it led to a clearer realization of what is permanent in its organic foundations and what is merely temporary in its shifting manifestations. 
that is a realization which is no mean task to achieve and is difficult for many even yet so intelligent a traveller as mrs bishop miss bird on her first visit to japan came to the conclusion that japanese women had no modesty because they had no objection to being seen naked when bathing twenty years later she admitted to dr bales that she had made a mistake and that quote, a woman may be naked and yet behave like a lady unquote. in civilized countries the observances of modesty differ in different regions and in different social classes but however various the forms may be the impulse itself remains persistent modesty has thus come to have the force of a tradition a vague but massive force bearing with special power on those who cannot reason and yet having its root in the instincts of all people at all classes it has become mainly transformed into the social customs the emotion yields more readily than in its primitive state to any sufficiently strong motive even fashion in the more civilized countries can easily inhibit anatomical modesty and rapidly exhibit or accentuate in turn almost any part of the body while the savage indian woman of america the barbarous woman of some mohammedan countries can scarcely sacrifice her modesty in the pangs of childbirth even when among uncivilized races the focus of modesty may be said to be eccentric and arbitrary it still remains very rigid in such savage and barbarous countries modesty possesses the strength of a genuine and irresistible instinct in civilized countries however any one who places considerations of modesty before the claims of some real human need excites ridicule and contempt end of the evolution of modesty part two section three